All right, I think it's 225, and you are in for 90 minutes of Container D. Um, so yeah, this is the Container D Mini Summit, which is a name we came up with, and the conference organizers didn't tell us we couldn't call ourselves a mini summit, so it feels very important. Um, but it's just, instead of having an intro and a deep dive, Session, we thought we'd just combine. We have a whole host of our maintainer crew here for core container D, for the CRI. Um, so several of us are gonna be speaking um, and kind of combine status, some deep dives, and then uh, depending on how long-winded we get, uh, we hope to save a good amount of time for some Q&A. And if people don't have questions, uh, we've made up questions so that we'll have something to talk about. So that's kind of the flow, um, and I think we have that here. So I'll start with a little bit about, you know, what's going on with the project right now, and then uh, we'll get some deep dives on the core and CRI and Windows. And then, like I said, we have a, a good cross-section of our maintainers here this week, and they're here, and, and we can uh, take your questions or talk about uh, things you're interested in. So, um, hopefully, if you're here, you're well aware of what Container D is. Um, you know, this came up yesterday at the end of my talk. You know, this runtime word is, is overloaded, but it's pretty easy to just call ourselves a container runtime. Kind of between and below, you know, things like Kubernetes and Docker uh, are above us, uh, but we're above lower level runtime. So, OCI run C is our default. Um, to actually, you know, run containers at the OS layer, and then obviously you have the sandboxes like Kata and um, Firecracker and Gvisor. So that's obviously kind of generally what we are. Um, we handle the resource management, so when Derek takes you through the architecture and walks through some of those flows, you know, we're managing the container process lifecycle, the image uh, artifacts, so talking to registries, resolving image names to uh, manifests and, and configs. Um, the snapshot system, so again, how, how you actually build up the copy on write file system and, and the various implementations that we have. And then the metadata around that. Um, uh, again, the focus of Container D since, since uh, the project started has been very tightly scoped, so we're not trying to take the place of the full Docker experience um, or, you know, other sort of additional, what, what you might think of as value add, you know, pieces of, of a more full runtime ecosystem. Our governance is such that it takes uh, full agreement of all the maintainers to change that scope and the only thing we've really done uh, since joining the CNCF is adding the CRI team as a uh, component of the project. So bringing the CRI plugin into Container D as a built-in component is really the only thing we've changed from that original statement of our scope. Um, so where are we this year? Um, obviously, we talked about this at Barcelona because it, it had happened then, but we, we, uh, we are a graduated project, the fifth one in the CNCF. Um, we've had broad support and tons of, of great contribution from across the ecosystem, we now passed a couple hundred uh, contributors representing, you know, if you look at the dev stats that the CNCF maintains, there's over 100 companies who've at least contributed something uh, to the Container D project. We now have 13 maintainers who represent nine different companies. Um, and I think they're cheering for that, I guess, um, which is great. Uh, so yeah, we've got a great great set of maintainers and reviewers that has, has grown in the last year. Um, in some way, all the major cloud providers are, are using Container D. Some of them obviously still use Docker as, as part of their managed services. Uh, we'll talk about who's using it directly. Uh, we have good Linux and maturing Windows support. Uh, multiple architectures are, are supported. We have some new activity in uh, CI where we're trying to add, now that Travis has more architecture support, we're trying to add ARM and potentially Power and Z. Um, 
And we also did some governance modification just uh, this summer, maybe late, late, a couple months ago, where we now have the ability to add sub-projects that aren't part of the core Containerd project set. And the couple projects that came up that made that really um, just a sensible uh, direction was there's a Rust-based implementation of TTRPC that uh, they're proposing to add as a sub-project. And we have the image encryption library uh, that IBM Research uh, developed as part of the overall uh, encrypted container images work that there's a KEP and other work across the ecosystem going on. So generally that's kind of, you know, what's been going on uh, across the project. Uh, like I said, we have a growing number of kind of users and use cases that includes public cloud, so both GKE and IBM's managed Kubernetes service directly offer Containerd as a runtime for your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, but there's also infrastructure, uh, infrastructure projects like Kind uh, that have started using Containerd or at least uh, making that available. You've got end users, so Ticketmaster came in and talked to us yesterday after one of the talks. Uh, they switched to use uh, Containerd in their self-managed clusters. Uh, there's some others that haven't given us approval to, to share widely, but uh, definitely there's growing adoption there. Uh, DevOps tools, so Weaveworks Ignite or Firecube, uh, they're using Containerd via the, the Go API. And then all the custom sandboxes, so a talk I gave at both Barcelona and then yesterday here, uh, you've got Firecracker, Gvisor, Kata, all have shim implementations uh, for Containerd um, that also use Containerd in that way. So um, maybe a good springboard from just saying, here's a list of people using it. Uh, it's interesting that those uses fall really in different camps, sort of how they're using Containerd. One way to use Containerd is essentially as a library. So maybe you don't even want to use the container daemon to run containers, but you like the client API. So there's things like Oros that are, that are using or implementing certain aspects of the API, like the content store using the resolver and, and uh, that API. You've got BuildKit that can drive container D via the API as well. Uh, I mentioned Weaveworks, Weaveworks Ignite. Uh, IBM Cloud Functions also drives container D uh, via the Go API. Then you've got extensibility points within Containerd, so remote snapshotters and, and resolvers. So uh, when Amazon gave their talk a couple days ago, um, they showed their custom ECR resolver. Um, Azure has their telemetry uh, project, which has a custom snapshotter. Do I have that right? Tele oh my goodness, I said telemetry. Yeah, sorry about that. This is not, this is not a great uh, advertisement, but do not search on Azure Telemetry because I'm not sure what you'll find, but Teleport is an actual project. Um, I just wanted to confuse people, I'm sorry. Uh, and then, you know, just simply that Containerd has created a set of packages in our uh, GitHub repo. Some of them are sub-projects of the main project. Lots of other projects are finding those useful, and so, you know, if you go look at who's importing, like Containerd C groups, which is just a nice generic C groups implementation, you know, even the, the Creo project uh, imports some of those packages and uses them. So there's kind of the library aspect of Containerd. There's obviously the ability to use it as a Kubernetes CRI runtime. So I already mentioned IBM's IKS, GKE, Ticketmaster, Alibaba Cloud, MicroKates, Kind, K3S, all these are using Containerd as a pure just Kubernetes runtime via the CRI plugin. In the non-Kubernetes use case, you can also simply just use the daemon. So Docker relies on Containerd's gRPC APIs um, a, as a running daemon, similar to how BuildKit, you can point it at a Containerd running daemon and use that uh, for building uh, via BuildKit. So that's kind of, you know, general ways, uh, different ways that, that Containerd is used. Just a few months ago, we released our, our next kind of major series, Containerd 1.3. Um, some of the, the biggest uh, sort of new features that were in that release, Windows support uh, via the Shim v2 API, 
uh, device mapper snapshotter, which was contributed by Amazon and the Firecracker team. Um, a new plugin interface, interface for processing layers, so the encrypted um, container work is using that, so you can actually have external tools which uh, can deal with certain media types and process that, uh, that byte stream, for example, decrypting, compressing in special ways, decompressing. Uh, so that was a great addition to 1.3. And then CRI added support for uh, per pod container shims. So instead of running a shim for every container, you can run a shim uh, for per pod. And then uh, in progress work, so again, moving beyond 1.3, looking toward 1.4, um, there is uh, remote snapshotter work for sharing snapshots in a cluster. So there's a lot of interest around this. Uh, maybe you've heard of Google CRFS. Uh, CERN has been interested with their CVMFS. So you, you know, you've got a clustered uh, architecture, you don't want to pull images to every node in the cluster because you have a shared file system that you want to pre-populate. Um, so this is a, uh, there's a lot of interest in this. There's several issues and kind of proposals open and, and that work is, has been started. Uh, C groups V2, this is work that's already ongoing. You can look at the, the C groups uh, sub-project of Containerd on, on GitHub. You'll see a lot of PRs in the last few weeks. Uh, bring a, bringing in uh, C groups V2 support. Uh, the CRI team is working on more complete uh, Windows support and, and getting that into CI. Uh, there's uh, a whole um, aspect of uh, better management for uh, mounts and resources that, that Containerd would give you ways to, to help manage those life cycles. Uh, Derek can talk a bit more about that if you're interested. And then again, I've mentioned the image encryption, so kind of finalizing and finishing up that work in the CRI. Uh, so there's sort of that full life cycle through Kubernetes to deal with encrypted image layers. So that gives you a flavor of what we, where we are, uh, what we're working on, and now I'll turn it over to Derek to uh, dig deeper. All right, thank you, Phil. Oh, this is really shaky up here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I didn't add anything about resource management, though. But we we can we can talk about that at the we can talk about that at the end. Uh, all right, so I'm going to go through the architecture of Container Sum. We're going to drill into uh, the different parts of it. I'm hoping that at the end of this, you'll have an idea if you're a user of Container D, uh, whether you know it or not, where it's fitting in your stack today. Um, and if you want to contribute to Containerd, maybe you'll get an idea of where you might fit into this or uh, based on what you know about Containerd or what you're interested in. Uh, so we're first going to talk about Containerd mostly focused on the, the daemon part, which is going to be the, the center part of this. Uh, so firstly, we're going to talk about the API. Uh, this is how uh, users are going to interact with Containerd itself, so whether that's through the CRI interface or through Containerd's gRPC um, or just getting metrics uh, through Containerd. So for the CRI uh, implementation, it's it's actually just a plugin. It's a gRPC plugin uh, that's built in, so there's no extra hop or anything. You just use the Containerd socket uh, that everything uses and uh, point the kubelet directly at Containerd, and it will, it will be able to use that interface. Uh, so Kubelet can just be configured to use uh, Containerd directly as a runtime using its uh, socket. Um, also, we have the, the gRPC API, which is primarily used by the Go clients. So unlike if you're familiar with the CRI API or, or the, the Docker API, it's, it's a little bit higher level whereas Container D API is, is pretty low level. It gives you access to uh, roughly the components that Container D is using internally. Uh, so if, whether it's the snapshots, it will give you direct access to what the snapshotter API is, uh, the content store, containers, creating containers, creating tasks, events. Uh, the gRPC API mirrors uh, what the underlying uh, services actually look like. And then for metrics, exposed through Prometheus, through Prometheus API, 
Uh, this will actually expose metrics for the container D process as well as uh, container level metrics. It's not enabled by default, but you can enable it with the container D config uh, by just going in and providing the address that you want the metrics API to listen on. In the core of Containerd, we have all of our service implementations. Uh, so these are, this is a, this is roughly what the uh, components and services that we have in Containerd are. Uh, most of them are represented here. Uh, so a lot of them make sense. So image service will have uh, snapshot service, container service. We'll also have stuff for handling uh, the namespaces that Containerd does. Uh, we'll have a lease service, which is actually used. Uh, it's used part of our resource management so that uh, it helps Containerd able to keep track of what objects that are created, uh, who's using it, and uh, tracks when, when we're actually able to remove those. Uh, our metadata store in Containerd, it's, it handles uh, just like labeling on all our different objects that we have, uh, all the resources, um, it ensures that they're all referenced by uh, top-level resources, such as like an image or, or a container. Uh, when any of these resources are no longer used, we have a garbage collector that will actually go through and keep track of what's no longer used. Uh, all that stuff is namespace, so if you're using CRI, we use a, it's kds.io namespace. If you're using uh, Docker, it's a Mobi namespace. Uh, they won't actually see each other's content, um, but they're able to share that content under the, under the hood. So if, if two of them are using the same, pull the same content from the registry, uh, they can both reference that same content and the metadata store will keep track of who's actually using it. And then once it's no longer used, it will be able to garbage collect that. Um, now in the back end of Containerd, this is where we get more the raw resource management. So stuff like storing the actual snapshots file systems, as well as the content. Uh, these are all handled in our backends, um, as well as the actual runtime implementations that uh, call out to uh, all the runtimes I've been mentioned before, whether it's Run C or um, any of the implementations. So for the content store, we have a built-in local implementation. So this is pretty, it's a pretty simple implementation. It's just, there's a file system and the content is named by a hash, so it's just a, a content addressed uh, file system uh, layout, and there's the ability to plug stuff in. Right now you can only use one at a time, uh, but uh, we do have a plug in point there so you can actually swap out the content store. Snapshotters are a little different. There's, there's multiple built-in snapshotters, and the clients can actually select which snapshotter to use. Uh, the snapshotter is, gonna, is what provides the copy on write storage, uh, analogous to Docker's graph drivers. Uh, we have union file system implementations, such as overlayFS, uh, AUFS, um, as well as block device implementation. So we just added device mapper. Uh, you can use ButterFS, uh, as well as ZFS. Uh, so the, we, have the, we have multiple snapshotters. They're, they're all built in, and when you start up Containerd, they're all initialized, uh, but the client is actually able to send along which snapshotter it can use. So like if you're used to Docker, when you're like configuring it, you, you configure like, I wanna use this graph driver, and then when, it, when Docker starts up, like that's everything you use can only use that, and if you switch to a different one, everything kind of disappears, and. Uh, you're in kind of like a whole new, almost like a whole new world here, whereas here the, the snapshots and the images, are, they're completely separated. So you can have images that aren't in the snapshotters, you can have images that actually are unpacked into multiple snapshotters here, uh, and let the client manage all of those. Now I, I mentioned the runtime, so uh, as an example, some of the runtimes we have uh, implementations for. So in Containerd 1.2, we stabilized the the shim interface. So this, this API it uses, a, it uses a lightweight gRPC called TTRPC, it's like teeny tiny RPC, it has really small memory footprint. Uh, and each of, the, each of the shims are a separate binary. 
they'll listen on a they'll listen on a socket using TTRPC, and then uh, the containerd v2 runtime has has a client which will connect to those runtimes uh, to actually uh, manage all the container lifecycle. Uh, v2 is now default. Uh, v1 is still in there, but it's it's uh, it's deprecated. Um, so I'm going to go through a few flows uh, using some of these service interfaces. You can see how uh, you would pull an image, push an image, and run a container uh, using containerd. So first, we're going to go through the pull flow. So some of the actors that we're going to go through is we have the diff service, the content service, snapshot, or an image service. Uh, you've got to kind of got an idea of, of where that fits into the core of containerd. Um, then we're going to have a client that's actually going to be driving the, the pull operation. And then uh, since in this case there's going to be a registry involved, uh, implementation of the distribution API, um, v1, whatever, someday. Uh, but using the, <laughs> sorry, I saw you guys there. <laughs> but yeah, any, any OCI registry or Docker registry, whatever you want to call it, will, will work here. Uh, the first thing that happens in a pull, in this case, we're going to get the manifest. So unlike in Docker, where it's always the daemon that's going to be connecting to the registry, uh, it's a little different with, well, it's, it's a little different with containerd in that it's our client that actually does all the pull implementation. So in, in the Docker case, it's still Docker connecting to the registry, but if it's the CRI plugin, the CRI plugin connects. Um, but if you have a client such as BuildKit or CTR or some custom tooling you have that's going to pull an image, it's actually your client that's importing the, the, the Go containerd client that's actually going to do the connection to the registry. And then from there, it just looks like just normal HTTP interaction. It's going to uh, it's going to request the manifest. It's going to do some authorization, and then it's going to pull down the resources that it needs for that manifest. Uh, once it has those resources, it's going to connect to Containerd's content service, and it's going to store that manifest. Um, and then for each layer, it's actually going to go back to the registry. It's going to retrieve each of those layers, which is just one request to go in. Uh, request that layer content, and then it's going to put each of those layers into the content service. Now, for each of those layers, uh, just pulling the layers isn't necessarily enough to run an image. Uh, so to unpack those for each of the layers, first we're going to prepare a snapshot. That's going to go back through, uh, if it's from the container engine into, let's say, the overlay snapshotter. It's going to connect through a GPC interface, talk to the uh, the service, and then uh, that's going to go back to the back end. Um, then from there, the, we're going to use a diff service to actually do the unpacking. So in this case, the, the client will just send to the diff service uh, what, what the layer that it wants to unpack, as well as the mounts that it got from preparing the snapshot. Uh, the diff service will actually get the content directly from the content service, so the, the data is not going kind of back and forth to the, from the content service back to the client. Uh, the diff service uh, allows doing this directly. And the diff service will actually handle the mounting and unpacking and return the, the layer descriptor. Um, but it should be noted that the, the client itself could do that if it wanted to. It could actually do the mounting and unpacking if it wanted to do that in some custom way. Uh, but the diff service makes that more efficient. Um, then at the end, after that, after that layer has been unpacked, uh, it will be committed back to the snapshotter, and now it went from having a read-write layer where it could do this unpacking, now we'll have a read-only layer. Uh, and then we'll create an image uh, from that, and that's going to be the end of the pull flow. The push flow is pretty simple in Containerd. Uh, we just have an image service and a content service involved. Uh, the first thing Containerd is going to do is it's going to get the image from the image service. It's basically just going to be a string lookup to a descriptor. The descriptor is just going to have a media type, a size, and a hash. Um, and then it can use that hash to get it from, uh, from the content service. So it will read the manifest. From the manifest, it will read all the layers, read those layers, send them all up to the registry, send up the manifest, and that's all there is to the push. Uh, so if you were to compare this to, say, what, what's done in Docker today, uh, there's a lot more involved in the push. 
because it's actually generating a lot of this, this content, so it actually would be going to uh, Docker's equivalent of the snapshot to actually generate these layers on the fly. It doesn't actually have the manifest, so it will actually generate a new manifest. Uh, so in this case, Containerd assumes that you either have some builder that's doing it or uh, you're keeping that content around uh, if, you, if you intend to repush it. Okay, so let, let's get into what a, what a run image looks like. Uh, so likewise, there's still going to be the snapshotter service involved, but we're also going to be using the container service, the task service, and then as well as a runtime implementation. And those runtimes we'll talk to a shim. Uh, so first, we're going to prepare a snapshot. So that's going to take, usually as a base, some, uh, some read-only snapshot. So that could be uh, whatever your image snapshot is, it's going to prepare a writable layer on top of it. Um, then it's going to create uh, a new container uh, using, using that snapshot and whatever your, your configuration is for that container. Uh, and then it's going to call into the task service, create a new task. So that task service is going to go down into the runtime. That runtime is actually going to exec your shim, which will create a, a new shim process. And then it's going to uh, tell that new shim process to create uh, create this container, or create this task inside that shim. Um, the runtime is going to return that task back to the task service, and then the task service will pass out in the PID and the con container IDs back to the client. Uh, at this point, uh, Containerd itself doesn't have any network setup. The client can do this. So if it's the CRI implementation, it will use CNI to do all the network setup. Um, but at this point, you have the process ID that you need in order to do anything. So all the namespaces are created. Um, you can do anything. This is, this is normally the time which the network setup is going to be done by the client. So at this point, usually the client will issue a wait. Um, it's going to go all the way down to the shim, and it's just going to wait on that, uh, wait on that container. And then it's going to start that container. So the start is just going to go down to the shim. It's going to tell it to start. And then you have a running, uh, running container. When that container exits, that exit uh, is going to return from that same weight. Um, and, then the, and then the client can go ahead and do any cleanup that it wants to do. Um, if it, when it goes and actually deletes the task, when it's the last task, it will actually shut down, uh, shut down that shim. Um, there will be no more uh, container process there anymore. And then just to clean up, uh, delete the container, and then it'll delete the snapshot. All right. So let's talk a little bit more about plugins. Uh, if you, Phil mentioned the, the talk a couple days ago about extending container D, that, that went through a pretty good job of, of going through some of these plugins. Um, I'm going to talk about kind of how some of those plugins, or where some of those pluggable spots are in container D. I mentioned kind of the back end being a good spot uh, where these plugins, uh, where, you can, where you can implement all of these plugins. And this is where we've seen kind of the biggest pickup from the, from the community, whether that's from implementing snapshotters, customized snapshotters, um, or especially the, the shims. Uh, so the Firecracker shim, Gvisor, all of those implementations um, are done at this layer. So for the content store, uh, it's in the snapshotter, they both use what we call the proxy plugins. Um, you can build them in as well, but the, the proxy plugins allow basically taking a container D binary and you, just, you can just configure it without recompiling it uh, to test out your, uh, mostly for the snapshotters, it's the most useful, but uh, it allows you to do your implementation without having to continuously recompile. Um, this is how the device mapper uh, snapshotter was originally created and made it much, much easier to implement. Uh, likewise, for the, the runtime shim, since they're just separate binaries, there's no need to uh, recompile or make a bunch of changes to container D. They can just be uh, implemented against our, our interface. For the clients, we've really made a push to make our client very extensible. Uh, so we want basically the ability to customize any part of the flow. Since our API is, pretty, is broken down into low-level components, uh, we want to be able to switch out any of those components, uh, do any sort of customization or, or, or plugins that you want at, in, the, in the client. So a common pattern you'll see is 
uh, we have these options on creating when you create the when you actually create the client or when you create some of these services or you go to do a poll. Uh, so we'll have these like service options where you can actually go and say uh, configure container D. I want to use this implementation of the service. You can just override one service and keep all the other defaults, um, or um, you can you can have a complete implementation if you wanted to say have a client that didn't talk to container daemon at all, uh, you, you can do that here as well. Um, just like, uh, I think a good example of that is when we moved CRI, it used to be out of process, and we moved it in process. It was able to leverage this to, from using container D from a separate, as a separate process to actually a plugin in, that's built into container D. Uh, it was able to just basically switch these options to say, now I just want to use these service implementations that are inside of the process rather than um, connecting over a gRPC. Likewise, for we have these remote options that allow you to basically customize. Re by replacing the resolver, you're basically replacing the entire like pull flow. You can you can not even use a registry at all. Like our default implementation is based on the uh, based on the distribution API. Um, but if you use something else, you can, uh, all, all it needs to do is be able to turn some, some string into content, and that's what, the, that's what the resolver allows you to do. So uh, what we've tried to do internally is, is use kind of the same plugin model um, that, we would, that we would ask uh, kind of anyone that's implementing a plugin to do. So like we've, we've tried to make all our internal components loosely coupled. Uh, clear boundaries for uh, how these plugins will interact with each other. Um, we define like different types for what these plugins are, and then each of the plugins register themselves. So even internally, all these components that you saw, they all just register themselves as plugins. Um, they all define uh, what their dependencies are. So there's no place in Containerd that's basically listing out or defining like what the ordering of what all these plugins are, the plugins will actually define this. We will create a dependency graph, and actually, when we start up Containerd, it will resolve that graph and initialize everything in the in the correct order. So then, if you wanted to add your own custom, uh, you wanted to customize Containerd, like have your own Containerd binary and add your own uh, built-in plugins, it's pretty easy. Uh, all you have to do is is import all the components that you want. You can import all of container Ds and add your own. You can swap them out. Um, and then you just build your own main function. And the main function is pretty small. You just initialize the app and run it. So I'm going to go through a quick example of what the Snapshotter proxy plugin looks like. So if we have a, if you look at what our Snapshotter interface looks like, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty small. It's what you might expect from a copy on write interface. You can prepare something, you can commit something, remove something, list. Um, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, we use, we actually return mounts um, instead of doing the raw operations inside the snapshot. So uh, the snapshotter itself doesn't handle any data coming in and out of it. It can just give you mounts that the client can use in order to operate on those uh, file systems. So you, as an implementer of this, just need to implement our, uh, the snapshotter gRPC API um, and then the back end will proxy those uh, requests when it's configured to use that. And then to, imp to compile it as a separate uh, binary, uh, we, we have some helpers. You just take your snapshot or implementation. Um, you can use our helper, which will just listen on a Unix socket, and then you can configure Containerd in order to use, uh, use that proxy plugin. Uh, likewise, for the runtime plugins, uh, the Shin v2 API, it's, it's pretty minimal in what, uh, what it's designed to do. It handles the execution lifecycle of a container uh, to use, like, if you create your own and you want to test it out, uh, you can pass in the runtime using, uh, here's an example where you would use IO container D run SC dot v1, um, and this will actually look for the binary container D dash shim dash run SC v1, and it will use that uh, when you specify that runtime. And then to actually do the implementation, you implement the, the task service. The task service handles the create deleting and uh, everything you'd expect to do from uh, to a container at a low level. 
um, including getting kind of the metrics uh, or getting the stats on it, shutting it down, uh, all that kind of stuff. And we have, I, I didn't have a slide for it, but similar to the snapshot API, we have helpers where if you have an implementation of the task service, uh, can create a binary pretty easily uh, directly from, from the implementation. Uh, so that's all I have for the, the internal discussion. Uh, Lantau's, uh, wait, I got a slide for you as a bridge. Uh, he's gonna talk about kind of the Windows implementation and CRI. Hello. Oh. Where's the HDMI? This one? Four, four. Four, one, two, three. Number four? Oh, okay. Uh, hi everyone, uh, I'm Lan Chao from Google, and I'm uh, uh, both a Kubernetes and Kubernetes maintainer. And uh, oh, by the way, I'm using a different template. This is the the KubeCon template. But I, to be honest, I think the Derek one is much better than this one. But <laughs> yeah, let's go with this. I, I don't have time to change it. Uh, uh, and I'm Lan Chao, and I'm going today. I'm going to introduce. Uh, so, uh, give some status update of the, uh, uh, the some recent work we are doing to make Kubernetes work on Windows and using container D as a container runtime instead of Docker. And I, I'm happy that actually in the container D community we always we keep have new things coming up so that I, so that every KubeCon I can talk about something new. And for KubeCon Shanghai, I talked about Gvisor and demoed it, and now I, ha I can have something new to demo, which is the Windows support. So I'm going to briefly introduce it and demo, uh, have a lab demo. So the uh, uh, content I will first, first brief, briefly introduce what is Windows Container. There is some other session we'll go deeper into this. Oh, KubeCon has already end, ended, but there was some session. So, uh, but to, 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 to make it easier to understand the following things, we still need to cover, uh, briefly cover what is Windows Container, and then uh, I will give some status update of the, uh, the, the sta uh, Windows support in Container D and in Kubernetes, and lastly, uh, the th some recent effort we're doing to make everything work together. Uh, firstly, Windows Container. And actually, there are two flavors of Windows Container. One is called the Windows Server Container, uh, which is more Linux container-like. Uh, basically, all the containers on a node will share the same Windows kernel, and uh, those containers are isolated with um, uh, some pro process isolation technology in, in Windows. So that's one. Another one is Hyper-V container. And in this flavor, basically, each container is just a Hyper-V VM, and each VM has its own kernel inside. Uh, uh, this is Hyper-V. And if you compare them, they, they both have pros and cons. Uh, so for the uh, Windows container, uh, because all the containers share the ho uh, host OS kernel, so it's much more lightweight, and you can have high, higher density. And also, because there's no hypervisor, you can use it inside a, uh, in a virtualized environment. Uh, and if you're using Hyper-V, and you want to use it inside the virtual uh, VM, you, you need nested virtualization. But on the other hand, a Windows Server Container has weaker isolation uh, because of similar reason. It, it, does, uh, it shares the kernel, a host kernel. And it, uh, one, uh, another problem is that it has very hard dependency on the host OS version. And uh, for the version dependency, uh, here, uh, here is the brief explanation of why. Uh, basically, uh, for the Windows Container, each container image has a, a base layer. You, you, ha you must have it. And uh, Microsoft provides two kinds of base layers. One is a very large one called Windows Server Core. Uh, it has the best compatibility, but it's large. Uh, after uncompressed, it's five gigabytes, so it takes a long time to pull it down. 
and, and another one is called Windows Nano Server. So it's much smaller, but it only supports a fixed style of framework or application. So you, you may want to choose which one you use based on your application. And for Windows Server Container, uh, they have the hard requirement that your this base layer have to ma match the major minor build ver version of the, the, the host OS. So let's uh, use an example. On the right side, so let's say, let's say that today you have a container which, uh, which uh, whose base layer is, has the exactly the same version with the host version. And tomorrow you want to uh, update the host. If you are only updating the, the revision number, the last digit, that's fine. Everything still works. But if you are uh, updating the second last, the build number, then your container don't run. So please keep this in mind because this may affect your, uh, if you're using Windows Server Container, this may affect your CI/CD workflow. You may need to rebuild your image whenever you upgrade the, 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 the ho uh, host OS version. And another interesting thing that Windows uh, uh, container also support Linux container on Windows. So they have the special term, uh, W call is Windows Server on uh, Windows. L call is Linux container on Windows. And basically for, to support Linux, they just run a Hyper-V VM and run, running the container and Linux kernel inside the VM. And uh, that's another thing you may want to know. And then now let's talk about the, the container D uh, Windows support. Uh, uh, thanks to the container D, uh, uh, container D is well-defined plugin interfaces. I, actually, Derek has covered a lot of them. So there are a lot of plugin points in container D. And the Windows support is added basically as just the several container D plugins. It doesn't touch. It didn't touch the uh, Canary D core at all, uh, at all. And for the image part, we need a snap uh, snapshot plugin and a diff plugin. Uh, we, uh, we need it for both Elka L Linux container and uh, WK Windows container. And for the runtime part, they, uh, we need a shim v2 implementation, basically a Canary D shim that understands how to start and manage Windows container. And Microsoft built it, and it's out of the Canary repository. Uh, so for the image part, I think the work, uh, Derek has already covered the workflow. Basically, the only thing we need to change is we need a div plugin to apply the, the, the changes for each layer, and also need a Windows snapshotter to manage the snapshots. The reason is that on Linux, we have overlay file system, we have a uh, better file system, but on Windows, they have th something different. It's similar with uh, a union file system, but it's, it's just different. So they need, they need their own plugin to handle that logic. So that's how the image is handled. And for the runtime part, uh, basically we just need to tell, uh, let Canary understand that for Windows container, you need to use this shim instead of the standard one. And the sh this sh under their shim will understand how to uh, talk with the, the Windows operating system, the host computer service to start and manage the container. And then uh, the runtime part is done. So. It's just that, that simple. And here's the status of uh, the Canary D sub Windows support. So we support both Windows Server Container and Hyper-V. And we support both WCAL and LCAL. And everything uh, is, I think, is, uh, is feature complete in 1.3. But because of uh, 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 less, uh, I mean, lack of test coverage, so we still call it experimental. So we're working on improving the test coverage and uh, announce stable uh, as soon as possible. And now let's get to the Windows part. How, how, how's the Windows support, uh, sorry, Kubernetes part. How's the Windows support in Kubernetes today? So here's the Windows pod look like in Kubernetes today. Basically, uh, each pod has multiple Windows server containers. Uh, and all those containers share the same IP, and they share volumes, means that they can uh, access the same volume. But on Windows, there is no uh, namespace sharing. The only namespace they have is network namespace. So uh, for example, on Linux, you can have PID namespace sharing. In container one, you can, uh, if you configure it correctly, you can see all the process, uh, processes in container two, uh, which is not possible on Windows today. And also, there's no pod level resource limit. On Linux, actually, at the pod level, uh, level we also have a C group, and we apply resource limit here. But on Windows, uh, there's no such thing. 
Uh, and today, we, uh, Kubernetes don't have Hyper-V uh, support yet, but uh, we're working on it. So here's a picture of after we have Hyper-V support, things will be look like this. Basically, at the pod level, we are going to have a Hyper-V VM. And inside the Hyper-V VM, you have your own Windows kernel and multiple instance, uh, multiple Windows Server container. So that's what a Windows pod look like in Kubernetes today. And for the scheduling part, there are some, uh, there are some, some issues. Basically, uh, uh, today, even you only want to run Windows workloads, you still need some Linux nodes in your cluster. Uh, one of the reasons is that uh, actually some system add-ons and also the whole, Windows, uh, the whole Kubernetes control plane only support Linux today. So you have to run those on a set of Linux node and then create another set of Windows node to run your Windows workloads. So it means that all, uh, at least today, all the Windows cluster will have both Linux nodes and Windows nodes to make sure that you, your Linux container only run Linux, run Linux nodes and Windows container on, on Windows nodes, you need some scheduling mechanism. And we, uh, today we're using the node label and tent. Basically, for all the Windows nodes, we were, we're going to apply the label, that label and that tent by default. And with the label, you can say, I want to run my Windows pod on nodes having these labels, which are Windows nodes. And with the tent, it means that by default, all the pods are rejected because most pods are Linux pods, so they are all rejected. If you, if you have a Windows workload, you want to say that I want to run on Windows, you need to, you need to add some toleration. So basically, that's how you run Windows workloads today. You need to apply the node selector, saying that I want to run it on Windows. And also, the toleration means that I'm allowed to run on Windows. That's the scheduling part, and uh, I think the, uh, that's the uh, most important thing in the support, uh, Windows support today. And here is the status. Uh, we announced, uh, announced the Windows Node support GA in Kubernetes 1.14, uh, and several vendors have already uh, provided some uh, solution. Most of them are still experimental, like GKE, and I know that AKS also have some Windows container support. And it only support, can, uh, support Docker as a container runtime today. And that's why we are working on container D support. And it only support the Windows Server container. There's no Hyper-V. Uh, and with container D, we are going to add it, uh, add the Hyper-V support. And uh, one uh, uh, worth noting uh, limitation in that there is no privilege or host namespace support, uh, which caused some challenge for uh, uh, daemon sites like, like CSI, because uh, CSI needs privilege to do some host operation, which you can not easily do on Windows. And there are some working progress proposal or solution like CSI proxy. If you're interested, you can go and look at the, the proposal in Kubernetes uh, upstream. And for other limitations, uh, you can check the, the doc. I have linked here. And now, finally, let's get to our uh, recent work, which is make everything work together. And firstly, just one page to, to review, uh, to help us review what is CRI plugin, which, uh, because uh, for a container runtime to work with Kubernetes, you need to implement the Kubernetes container runtime interface. And for container D, our implementation is the, uh, a native plugin of container D. Uh, it was introduced in container D 1.1 and uh, GA since April last year. And here is how everything works on Linux. Uh, basically, Kubernetes gave us a CRI container config, for li uh, a Linux CRI container config. And we do some conversion. We have some logic inside the plugin and convert it to a, an OCI container spec, of course, also for Linux container. And we, uh, we create the pod level namespace and say groups. And we use Linux CNI plugin to set up the network. And we tell ContainerD that for this, con uh, for this group of container, please use the standard stream instead of some, something else. So, so after all this, we have a pod running and containers running inside. And for Windows, things are very similar. Basically, we're, the, the config we get from Kubernetes is Windows container uh, config. And we need to add new logic to convert it to OCI container spec for Windows, uh, on Windows, uh, Windows container OCI spec. 
and we need to set up the pod level network namespace. As I said, they only support network namespace. And we, for each pod, we need a single IP, so we need to set up this at the pod level. And uh, Microsoft also provides some Windows CNI plugin, like SDN Bridge, or I forgot the other one, the name of SDN Overlay, something. So we need to use those CNI plugin to set up the network on Windows. And of, of course, we need to tell CanDRD this time, use some special shim for Windows. Don't use the regular Rancy one. And then, as I said, the shim knows how to handle the kernel lifecycle after that. So that's it. We, we support Windows uh, Kubernetes and Canary all together. That's how it works. And <laughs> yeah, and, uh, some status update. Actually, everything already works in head except some small, uh, some small working progress items like a library store that today, if you queue container D, after it comes back, it, there's some problem with uh, picking up old running containers. We are fixing that, fixing that and also uh, it, it doesn't support uh, GMSA yet, and there's no hyper, uh, we're working, still working on Hyper-V support right now. And we have all the CRI level conformance test passing. We have some test, test dashboard, everything pass, passing. And uh, for Kubernetes, it will test its working progress. Most things are green, but there are some failures. We're still lo looking into it. Uh, oh. And our plan is to have uh, alpha support in Canary 1.4 uh, with Kubernetes 1.18, and all the working progress items I, I, I mentioned should be done uh, at that time, uh, except the Hyper-V stuff. And we, should uh, we, we plan to have equivalent test coverage with Docker on Windows. And for the Hyper-V part, we are going, as I said, we still plan to add it into Canary D, but it will be probably a separate release. Uh, we are making good progress on it right now. And now it's the demo time. Uh, uh, so we, I, I won't demo the cluster bring up because it's super slow. Uh, but this is how you bring up a cluster today. Uh, there's a pending change in upstream, and we are going to merge it very soon. So after it's merged, you just need to run this script, and then you can have a uh, Kubernetes Windows cluster with Canary on all the nodes, either Linux node or Windows node. And here's the thing I'm going to demo. I'm, I already have a... Uh, oh, sorry, I need to log into my machine. Okay, G Linux. This is the the thing we use in Google. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, oh no, G better demo. Windows demo this time. Yeah. Uh, can I see the screen? Yeah. Should I make it larger? Okay. So you will see I have uh, five nodes, one master Linux nodes. Oh, sorry. One ma. Hmm? <laughs> Sorry, white. <laughs> yeah, one master nodes, two Linux nodes, and two Windows nodes. And you can see that container D is used on all the nodes. But on Windows nodes, the version is unknown because I built it from container D head. We don't have a semantic version yet. But it's using container D, and you can see that it's Windows Server uh, data center. And uh, if you take a look at the, if you describe the node, you will see the, the, the label and uh, tent I mentioned. So here is the label. We mark it as Kubernetes, uh, Windows OS and also the tents to avoid other pods to schedule here. Okay. And now let's, let's create a, a simple workload. So in the workload, I'm going to have a service. It, it, this is a web server. And I'm going to have a service exposed by a uh, node port. And the, serv uh, the service itself is just a, a, a web server written in PowerShell. And you can see it's a uh, Windows image. And to make it uh, schedule to Windows, as I said, we need a selector and toleration. OK. So make sure we have no pause today. Let's try creating it. Uh, Okay, I think it, 
Okay, it's running. Actually, the I uh, said that the image, uh, the Windows-based image is super big, so it really takes minutes to download. But because I already downloaded it on the node, so it's very fast. Uh, okay, what do we do? Let's first exact into the, the, the part to make sure it is Windows. I'm not cheating you, you guys. So let's run PowerShell. You see, Windows PowerShell. It's, we, we're inside the container now. And <laughs> Uh, inside the pod and the container. And if you can get process, the, all those uh, things inside the container. And we have two PowerShells. One of the PowerShell is the, the web server we, we, we wrote. Okay, so we are using Windows. Uh, uh, so as I said, we have a service exposed. Let's see whether the network works. So this is the, the node, uh, node port, port means that we can access the service from any nodes. So let's just pick one of them. This is the public IP. So let's see whether we can access it and what's the port. Uh, okay. I remember the first time it may take a while. Mm, okay, yeah. This is our web server. It's basically counting how many times you access it. So we can, you can see it's, every time it's different. It's working. Uh, let me demo something else. Basically, uh, most of the things you know should work. Uh, for example, we can even put forward. If you don't know put forward, it's basically forward a remote uh, container apart uh, a port of the, the pod into your local environment so that you can access it locally. And even this works, let's try it. So, uh, get pods, this is a pod. Port forward, this, and let's forward to one, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, and now it, uh, the, the, the port should already uh, already been forwarded to your local environment, and if you, let's see, let's try access localhost, one, two, three, four, five, you should be able to see it. Yeah, you'll see. So port forward also works, and also let's demo, also demos getting the stats of the container. If you know kubectl top, it shows you the stats of the container. You can see we have the memory usage, and CPU is zero because it's idle. So. Let me see whether I can give it some CPU usage. <laughs> okay, it usually takes some time. Give me five seconds. <laughs> oh, okay. One more try. <laughs> Go. Come on, come on, come on. Okay. Okay, I will try it later. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I just tried it before before the, the the talk. It should work. I will try it after the next thing I do. And also, I want uh, another thing I want to show you that uh, you, uh, the local debug to also work. So let's try to get onto one of the Windows node. Uh, this one, you can compute. So let's get onto the Windows node. You'll see it's Windows. I'm more familiar with PowerShell, let's use PowerShell. And, oh, sorry, I need to export one thing. So for Canary D, the local debug tool, and actually also for Cryo, Cryo, the local debug tool we use is CryCuttle. And I already, inst uh, in the cluster, during the cluster bootstrap, we already installed it on the node. So if you run CryCuttle pods, you can see that, oh, the pod is running, you can see, and it, it is Windows pod. And if you run PS, you can see the container running, and we can even try to exec into it. Uh, PowerShell. Uh, you can see exec locally also works so that you can debug the, 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 the container locally. That's also get process. Yeah, everything works. Uh, okay, let's get out. And let me try one, one more time. Okay, <laughs> it worked, I'm sure. <laughs> but, but I'm just not clicking fast enough. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, finally, 
OK. Uh, 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 there seems to be some delay. Maybe it's a bug. But anyway, we got the CPU unit. <laughs> uh, I think that's the, uh, the thing, uh, everything I want to demo. And we can also delete it, delete it of course. Yeah, it will be gone. Uh, Yes, yeah, gone. So basically, most things you know already work for Windows, and there are some limitations in the document. You can go and take a look. At least D, if you compare Canary D with Docker, uh, there shouldn't be too much difference today uh, besides the, the, the work in progress part, and we're going to finish them uh, in Canary D 1.4. And that's it. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, we have panel discussion. Justin? All right, this one's on. Or you sit down here, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so basically, we're just going to hold a panel. Um, takes questions. Uh, well, if you guys don't have any questions, we'll sort of project some out into the audience you know, by asking our own questions to certain maintainers. Um, we've got a lot of a lot of people here that know the right answers for you guys. So yeah, we'll see what we can do here. Uh, first, first question. I'll ask it. <laughs> so, oh, there, there is. Some question. Oh, oh, go ahead. Maybe, maybe let's start with ours. Okay, sorry. <laughs> What's that? I, I mean, someone wants to ask question, so I don't. Oh, okay, know. we'll take your. You'll, you'll be the first question. <laughs> what, what do you have? You can ask anything. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, can I ask about uh, the recent work about remote snapshotter? Um, yeah, especially like a, yeah, and a Google CLFS and some VMFS, and uh, also Azure uh, tele teleportation, teleportation, uh, teleport. Um, could you, yeah, um, could you give me um, your maintenance opinion about remote snapshotters and uh, progress on it? Um, so I, I can try to answer that first about the remote snapshotters. Uh, oh, do you want to re re repeat the question? It was about the, mm -hmm. the state of remote snapshotters, my yeah, understanding? Yeah, state of the room. Okay. And what? Okay. Yeah, so like uh, there's, there's kind of the, the larger feature as a whole, just having this kind of cluster aware snapshots so that the, the main idea of it is so that if you have a cluster of, or you have a bunch of container Ds in your cluster and you want to pull an image in, um, you don't want to have to pay that cost of pulling the image on every single node necessarily if you have shared storage between those, uh, between those nodes. Uh, so the idea between remote snapshotters is that when you pull in an image, you can share those snapshots across all the nodes. Uh, so the way container D is architected, we have kind of, we have this resource management layer that keeps track of all the snapshots uh, that the node knows about. Um, and then underneath it, we have snapshotters that actually do the storage. So even if something is available on the storage, we don't necessarily know about it in container D uh, from a resource management perspective. Uh, so the main work behind the remote snapshotters and that we're going to have in the next release is updating that, uh, updating that middle core layer so that we can actually uh, make use of the snapshots if they're available on the back end uh, so that when we're actually doing the pull process, uh, we don't have to actually go through those steps of let's pull something and then try to extract it if the extraction uh, doesn't need to take place at all. Uh, so we can essentially try to do that preparation of the snapshots before we even get to the point of pulling it so that we never have to uh, open up that connection to the registry. Uh, so what, what it probably would look like uh, comparing the flow is we'd pull a snap or when we're going to pull uh, an image, we pull the, the manifest and then we can we can we know at that point uh, what that image is going to look like, and if we can go ahead and create that image, 
uh, based on the snapshots that are available, uh, we're going we're gonna to be able to do that. Uh, so that's going to be in the next release. We think it's a valuable feature, um, but the changes, that summarizes what we see as the changes to the core, um, but we're not necessarily going to provide an implementation of the cluster snapshotter. We see that's more of a, a community ecosystem thing, uh, but we want to make sure that our core can, can do that and not all of our pull tools handle that correctly. Um, did that, that answer the question? No. Yes? Excellent. Uh, you mentioned it was going to be next release. Any kind of schedule on that, or just we need more <laughs> more helpers? Or? We, we don't do time-based releases. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Cool. We, we'll release when uh, when there's a need to release, or usually when we have a, the next big feature. So we want Windows to be the next big feature in the release, but there's kind of a few other things about remote snapshotters or some other things that we're looking at. But usually it's the first big feature to complete we'll do a release, <laughs> and if we can group those together, we will, but yeah, we, we don't do time-based releases usually. We have point releases where we'll backport stuff too, so. Right. Okay. Well, um, I don't know if you guys know Akira. Um, he's been working on rootless support. Um, maybe you could say something about the, the state of rootless support inside of the stack. Uh, so uh, rootless is uh, uh, already supported uh, except uh, C group stuff. Uh, so currently, uh, you can run our containers, but you can't uh, limit CPU resources and uh, memory resources. Uh, but uh, we are going to uh, get uh, C group support uh, using uh, C group version two. Uh, it's already uh, supported by uh, Potman. Uh, it's kind of a competing project, and uh, we, we can uh, uh, follow uh, similar way. Uh, probably that requires us uh, using uh, System D uh, for allowing non root user to uh, configure a C group. Okay, cool. Anybody have any questions about rootless support any, or any other security type issues? Go ahead. We'll try to repeat it. Can you explain a little more about what's needed? Yeah, so the question is what's needed for you know, C groups in, inside of Container D? Do you know anything what's missing? or? Do we do anything in Run C? Mm -hmm. or, you know? uh, so uh, the uh, Run C uh, support for C group version two is in progress, and uh, actually uh, we need uh, more uh, reviewers for Run C project. Uh, but actually, as a C run, uh, which is uh, yet another implementation of OCR runtime spec, uh, already uh, supports uh, C group version two uh, with uh, rootless mode. And for, uh, for uh, Contra D, uh, we we need to uh, support uh, C group two. Uh, uh, both for root, root, rootless and root for mode uh, at first. And for uh, root, rootless mode, uh, we also need to uh, support a user instance of systemd. Uh, it's a run to, uh, for each of user, and uh, with uh, systemd API, uh, we can gain uh, delegated permission for C group version two. Brandon Liu of IBM Security. <laughs> so, so IBM this, is not, this, <laughs> this, this, this is not a security thing, though. But um, so I was trying to um, run the container D stuff, um, like the image stuff that we we're working on, in like a pipeline, like Tekton. Right. So like we had to run it in the container. So I think maybe I didn't try it hard enough. But I don't know what the rootless is also related to. Can we run, like maybe partial, um, part of the daemon inside the container so that we can like do image operations and stuff like that, or run build kit inside? I don't know. I maybe I didn't try hard enough. But yeah. uh, so uh, build kit uh, use uh, container D as a library, and uh, build kit D uh, uh, already supports rootless mode and. Uh, also, uh, we have a technical support for rootless build kit. And you can run a rootless uh, build kit as a port uh, without any uh, security configuration. Uh, but uh, at least you need to uh, disable SecComp uh, because uh, we have uh, some system calls for uh, containers.
Uh, so uh, we, we have a uh, rootless build example in uh, Tekton slash catalog repository. Okay. Yeah. So Kira, you, you mentioned uh, build kit. Uh, yeah. when, that was gonna be the next question, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Which uh, is, you know, uh, what is the state of you know, Moby using container D hmm? yeah, for, for building containers, things like that? What, how's it coming along? Uh, so I thought uh, about, about uh, Moby not, not uh, build kit, right? Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of people will ask the question, how do I build images with Containerd? And as, as uh, <laughs> uh, uh, So, uh, Build uh, supports Containerd uh, in uh, two different modes. Uh, the first uh, mode is uh, just using Containerd as a library. Uh, so, uh, you, you don't uh, even notice that uh, Containerd is uh, used. Uh, but uh, in most cases, uh, I think it's fine. Uh, but uh, if you want to uh, use Containerd, as a demo, uh, BuilderKit uh, also can connect to the demo. demo. Uh, but uh, in most cases, I think uh, just using Contradi as a library without demo, it's fine. And uh, anyway, uh, you can export the image as uh, any format, uh, such as uh, Docker format or OCI format, and uh, you can import uh, output the image to uh, Contradi or uh, whatever. Does that make sense? So uh, this one's going to be for Lantau. <laughs> <laughs> you did it. You mentioned GVisor earlier that you had given it a demo. Uh, could you talk about a little bit about, or do you have any status updates on where GVisor is? Uh, uh, with, with regard to uh, Container So, yeah, oh, yeah. as uh, GVisor. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, sorry, context <laughs> switch. Uh, yeah, I know. Right? <laughs> uh, for GVisor. Uh, so first, on the open source side, uh, to integrate with Canary D, just like all the other runtimes, we need a shame implementation, and we have an open source repository called GVisor Canary D shame. It's under Google Org. If you go and search, you will see it. And we're using, uh, with that, you can actually, if you set up properly, you can already use Kubernetes with GVisor in open source, but you need to set, understand it and set it up. Uh, so that's the open source data, and actually internally we were, we're also using that shame. And I also heard that Ant Financial, because they are using uh, GVisor, they are also using that shame because they use both Kubernetes and GVisor. So it means that it works. And we uh, on GKE we provide a, a product, uh, a, a feature, uh, feature on GKE called GKE Sandbox, and that that one is also using that shame and GVisor to provide a sandboxing for your pod. So that, that feature is beta, and we are working on uh, a GA8. So it's now GA8. We are working on it. And so that's the open source status and our internal status. Cool. And, and for GVisor, no, oh, yeah. And for GVisor itself, uh, we, I'm not part of the GVisor team. I'm the Kubernetes team, and we we'll, we'll work with GVisor team. And that team, uh, they are making good pro progress improving GVisor. Like uh, recently, they did a lot of things like add some IP table stuff support with, because they want to run some, uh, like some, something like the Istio sidecar inside the GVisor, so, so they are working on that. And also, they're improving the file system performance because if you know GVisor that, for GVisor, all the, uh, for security uh, reason, all, on GVisor, all the file system operation will need to go through a gopher, which is the go long process. And, uh, and it's using NIP. And for some reason, NIP, uh, uh, I mean, caused some performance issue with all the file system operations. And they're defining a new protocol to, uh, to make it more efficient. And I think they, they, have a, they have a design for that, and they're working on that. So that's their progress. And maybe they also have some other fancy stuff. But this is the, the one I know. <laughs> that's what you know. <laughs> Did you have a question? I think it was covered. Cool. Okay. Anybody else have any? <laughs> Scott? You're right here. Yeah, so I, this whole world of uh, the different container runtimes is new to me um, ish. Uh, I'm interested to know your thoughts, um, and I don't want to trigger any political things, but um, like CRIO or CRIO, and like. The differences there and why there's a shim layer needed for container D and 
why would why would somebody use one over the other? Is one just have more historical context? Um, I'm just interested in people's thoughts on cryo. Phil, you have a talk. Does anybody want to take that? Sure. Yeah, go ahead, Phil. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot more kind of backstory behind all that, I guess, than makes sense to really try and un unpack. But uh, both in Barcelona and then here yesterday, I kind of walked through, you know, Docker, Containerd, Creo, um, and kind of the pros cons. What you know, who created them? Why do they exist? Um, I, I guess. Uh, to me, the most important thing is like more not so much about where we came from, but future. And um, so talking to Vincent Batts, he was here in the session earlier, but I think he had to step out. Um, you know, I, I think right now it's not so much that there's like some amazing set of features in one that's not in the other. There are design choice differences. So, you know, Creo has was started as we're going to make a simple OCI compliant runtime for Kubernetes, and that's all it's going to do. Like it's not going to be extensible. It's not not going to have, you know, the snapshot proxy plugins. Kind of kind of this idea of extensibility around a, an API. Um, so you know that that's just a different design point. It's not necessarily one better than the other. It's you know I I think their kind of tagline was all the runtime that Kubernetes needs and nothing more. You know that. That was their design point. Uh, whereas Container D was, the CRI was a plugin that was one use case, but there'd be other use cases for Container D, and therefore all the all the pluggability, the ability to use piece parts. You know, you can use the diff service and not touch anything else because you can talk directly to that service through its gRPC uh, API, or with the Go kind of runtime library. Uh, but back to kind of the future, I, I think. You know, Vincent and I were talking uh, about, you know, it's, you know, is there a way to, to kind of solidify what we're offering into something that's more aligned so it's not like, oh, well, they pick Creo and they pick Container D and these must be competing, you know, projects. So uh, we'll see where that goes. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I think the. Misunderstanding. They both use a shell. Theirs is called Kanban, and, and ours is called Gen 2 Gen. But if you're talking about the shell between the Gen and the Gen, and the. Oh, you need a mic. mic. I'm not quite loud enough here. Mic. I thought I was loud enough without the mic. <laughs> well, Never they're, mind. They're recording. <laughs> ah, okay. Good point. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, so um, architecturally, they both have the same number of hops when Kubernetes kubelet requests a service that goes over the CRI, which is gRPC interface. When, 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 this, when the request comes in, it, it does. It does come into, you know, that's one hop, and it comes into a container runtime service that's acting as the client, right? When, when, a, when any container is executed, created, there, there is a little process that sits there in front of it. Um, and the, for, for the hosting of the services like streaming, um, like getting the return exit code, you know, whatever you need to do to host that, that container on a long running process so that you can reboot um, container D, you know, the container runtime and still have this, this container running, all right? Um, so theirs is called Kanban and ours is called the V2 Shem, okay? So I think at one point we had an extra hop. I'm sorry, I don't think. We had an extra hop and we've removed it. Uh, the, all the cry services that, that used to be on a separate hop is now built in as a built-in plugin within Containerd. Does that is, help? Is that, is that the shim you're asking about, the one you just described? Yeah, well, I'm just, the way cryo was described to me is that it was more lightweight. And I'm just trying to understand if that's true or not. Yeah, so his question is, is cryo more lightweight? No, no not really. Okay. I, yeah. I don't think so. I mean, we can run performance numbers that make Containerd look better, and they can make them okay. run better. <laughs> Um, the, I think what the main, one of the main differences is they can, they can run headless, they can, they can run without a daemon. Okay. Um, we prefer architecturally to have a daemon. We, we don't necessarily have to have one. We can reboot ours. They just have decided to reboot theirs on every 
instance. <laughs> okay, so it's a different architectural decision. Yuji, do you want to add anything about the cryo thing? Yeah, by the way, Yuji is the author of CRI. Can her and her mean her? Ah, place. yes. <laughs> which, which, which brings me to the next question. <laughs> uh, I think for Kubernetes, we don't want to dictate what kind of runtimes you are going to use. So when we designed the interface at that same time, there were several projects aiming to support this interface. And they all have different pros and cons, I'm sure. Uh, I was more involved with uh, the development in the early days. Now I'm pretty sure they all have features I don't know about. I did not do a side-by-side -side comparison. But like I would say, look at your, um, your OS distribution, your other like uh, stack, and what's actually supported better now, or do you have any special requirements for any features? And you can decide, and having options is not a bad thing. Yeah, and just as Yuji said, for example, uh, if you're using uh, GKE or EKS, they will decide, the, decide it for you. You don't need to care about it. And if uh, you're using, uh, uh, setting up your own data center, you uh, set up Kubernetes yourself, at least you will have an operating system, right? And whatever they provided is what you're going to use. Because when you choose the OS distribution, you already made the decision. Yeah. Like, like I, I remember early days uh, on Ubuntu, you don't have systemd, you have what, up, upstart or something. And on a rail, you have systemd. And how do you make the decision what to use? Basically, you choose the OS distribution and use whatever they provide you. And now, every, everything is using systemd now. So who knows what happens after five years? <laughs> so. Yeah, so Yuju is a, uh, one, one of the gut ladies sorry, <laughs> on, on Signode that, that's working on the CRI interfaces. And they get requests coming from both directions. They get requests from, from the Cryo and the Container D guys and other teams, right? Um, they're, they're wanting more Intels all over us for additional performance features. You got the Microsoft guys want to add CNAB and stuff. So things get pushed up and they come back down and the, the Signode team meets weekly and, and discuss some of these these issues, and, and the, they ask the Cry guys to come in and help. You know, people that are implementing these interfaces like Lantau. Okay, it's 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 a it's a lot of fun. Uh, so you, one of the questions that I had on the list here was, you know, gives you, you know, what what are the some of the new and upcoming changes that we can expect in CRI? Uh, I think there are many changes in the pipeline. Some of them are still in discussion or there's a proposal out. Uh, some of them are closer to implementation stage. Uh, like we have, uh, we have introduced a new uh, feature in Kubernetes called ephemeral containers, which is basically support uh, adding a container to a running pod mm. so that you can load it with a bunch of debugging tools and um, do the live debugging without having to destroy the pod. Cool. And that would require, for example, having the option to join a specific namespace of an individual container in the pod. So that's something we can expose in CRI. And there are also other things like um, resource updates. So uh, there's a proposal for adding support for huge pages in, um, for Linux only, of course, we don't have that support for Windows yet. And there's also the in-place resource update where you can actually modify the request of a container in a pod without having to kill it. Cool. And there are other things more on the discussion, like I think image, dis uh, image encryption, and also uh, there's one thing for like pol image polling progress, which is basically exposing the information through the Kubernetes API so that users can monitor the progress of that. Oh, cool, that'll be good. Especially for the so not just a timeout. I know I noticed that in in the Docker shim there's a <laughs> it just came up the other day that the Docker shim had a had one little switch in there for toggle. setting a, fi a a toggle for for a five minute duration for if the image doesn't come you know just abort kind of thing. But we don't have that in Cry today. We wait until it completes and then we come back up. So progress would definitely help so people wouldn't try to kill their their pods first. Yeah. Any, anybody have any questions for Yuju regarding new, these new features? No? Okay. Uh, one of the things we wanted to cover was some of the updates to CNI. Of course, we've, 
you know, we, we're, we're supporting the, the multi or dual stack um, IPv6 stuff that was added. And it's not just IPv6, it's also IPv4. Um, and we did it, I think we, when we did the implementation, we only tested two stacks. That's why they call it dual. But it's, it's a list, right? So you should be able to use any, any IP ranges that you want to use, configure those with CNI, and, and, and you know, just request that one. Okay. We're, we are uh, we are supporting uh, 071 of CNI and 076 of the plugins. Uh, we added CNI DNS support for the Windows team. We had debug support um, today. If you if you want to do your inspect your pods, you're going to be able to see exactly what happened when you know all these plugins for CNI were loaded. Okay, you'll see where they were loaded from the the configs. You'll you'll to get all the details so you can debug it now with an inspect pod, okay? Uh, there's a new feature coming, or it just dropped in CNI called check, and we'll probably have some inspect with, you know, ver verbosity that goes and checks the current state of, of all your CNI plugins. Anybody have any questions on networking? Yeah, it's pretty quiet. Anybody have any general questions before we... Uh, Phil, you know, there's, there's been a lot of talk about, oh, hey, cool, what you got? That's for the second time question, and um, about, um, about uh, yeah, SIM, about SIM, um, from the standards perspective, um, OCI runtime spec is um, st the standard interface for OCI runtimes, but in real world, in the real world, um, SIM, SIM is actually um, every OCI runtime has every uh, each SIMs. It's, and uh, yeah, in real world, uh, SIM API seems default standard for OCI runtimes. So, uh, um, so uh, do you have any plan to uh, like uh, make SIM API to standard or such kind of works? So this is a great question, right? We had this question many times. Um, it, I, Phil mentioned that we were going to sit down with Vince and sometime in the first quarter, um, get together the, all the whole OCI team. Maybe maybe we'll, that discussion will come up. Now I can use this as a, you know the question came up during during KubeCon, right? Um, it, yeah, we we knew from the start that Run C wouldn't be enough to cover everything, um, it, but it was just enough that if you had configured a, your config JSON, right, that you would be able to run one, okay, as long as you've got your, already got your mountable, you know, ready, ready to run, you know, runtime, and your config says on, on disk. That was really the plan. It wasn't meant to be this, this replacement API. Some, it, we never wanted run C to be a competition for Docker or any other high level, you know, like Podman, any other high level API tool, you know, a client tool. It wasn't meant to replace it. It was meant for to be infrastructure, right? And that's exactly what Container D is. It's just one more stack of infrastructure, not really meant to be used as a client tool. Okay? Does that help? Anybody else want to follow up on that or no? We have two minutes. So I don't... Any final yeah. questions? We've got, I'll give you the, I'll even bring you the mic. Thank you. Uh, so this is a really specific question. So uh, I've been working on some uh, stream to uh, using community. And uh, so I would like to pull down the image using a different user other than the, the user invoking the continuity process. Should I uh, build a plug into content, uh, content, oh, I've got the name content or snapshotter. Is that more of like a, a, a rootless style question, or you just want to be able to rename some, like use user mapping, or? Yeah, do some user mapping like with my images. Like let's say um, the, the root user starting container D, and I would like the image uh, with, uh, you know, change, change on to another user. I, I couldn't hear you. Yeah, was that, he was asking if that's use, using user namespaces, like sub IDs. 
uh, is, is, does not use uh, namespaces? Well, I'll, I'll just say like, um, there's, there's two ways to do it. The first one is like, yeah, you could, you could plug in, it would be a diff plugin if you wanted to do something custom and like on the unpack. Uh, so we have like an apply function that you can implement where if you wanted to do some customization, such as using some other mapping, um, but there's also like the, the operating system level mappings. I, I think I could hear knows more about this. Mm. Uh, so uh, uh, for uh, changing uh, all our uh, files are managed by subscriptors, uh, there is a way to uh, use uh, C join. Uh, it's already implemented as a uh, uh, some uh, client function in Kojidi. And there is also uh, ongoing uh, discussion to uh, use uh, for, uh, Fuse implementation of uh, such a uh, thing. Uh, so there is a Fuse file system uh, that translates uh, the UID and GID uh, so that uh, we don't need to do a uh, join. Uh, I'm not sure it, it answers uh, your question. Catch us on Slack and you can give me more detail. Sure, so I need to take <laughs> up your Slack then. Okay, I think you had one, one more question since we have the Amazon team here. Oh, I'm sorry, two more questions. But first, I would like to get the status of the, the Amazon Firecracker. Maybe you guys, I know you guys had a, already had a big pitch, but if you, Samuel, if you want to talk about it. You, know, you guys want to just give, it, give us a status update on where you guys are at? Just a quick summary for you. Sure. So. Um, Max and I here work at Amazon and we work on the Firecracker Container D project, which is a, a way to use um, the Firecracker VMM to run containers with hypervisor isolation. So it's yet another runtime that runs under Container D. Um, I, just a, I guess a quick update is we've made a bunch of progress on it. Um, we were able to run multiple containers inside one VM now. Um, I don't know. We've we've yeah we we've implemented a bunch of stuff with um, networking. Yeah, we, yeah we, we we built a snapshotter to provide the the container file system to the VM, uh, and that was the something that Max wrote and was able to contribute upstream to Container D, and now it's built into Container D. That's the new device mapper snapshotter. Um, Does it serve with ours, or do we need sensibility? Okay. Uh, so. Uh, the extensibility was like we built that first as a gRPC proxy plugin, so it was an out of process, uh, proce out of process plugin that ran alongside Containerd and Containerd would call out into, uh, and then I think it was fairly easy for Max to convert that to an in process thing. Yep. He's nodding yes, so <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, always, always, do you have any questions? Yeah, what, right. was your, what was your What was your or, question? We're, all, we're almost out of time, but I wanted well, to, to say, sure. yeah, yeah, we're out of time, but you know, we're all going to be around here for a little bit, so we can just come okay. up and ask questions here.